Okay, so all are able to see the screen also? The notes on the screen? Okay, great. So in welcome to today's class and today we will be going through the survey and briefly summarize the book of Chronicles. That is the first and second. Uh, so the author of this first and uh, first Chronicles does not specifically name, but then the tradition says that the first and second Chronicles were written by Ezra. So as per the date of writing, we see the completed books were probably compiled post-exile period, about 450 to 430, or some scholars say 425 BC, probably in Jerusalem, where the court records were kept. Now, for the purpose of writing this book, we see uh, the first and second chronicles cover mostly the same information as first and second Samuel and first and second Kings do. And also just like uh, the book of Samuel, as it was one single book, and also the book of Kings was one single book, even the book of Chronicles is actually one single book. And for the purpose of reading it and making it more clear, they divided the book into two, perhaps the and uh, and this book, the first and second Chronicles, focuses mostly on the uh, priestly aspect of the time period, and also it focuses on King David's rule. The book of first Chronicles uh, was written after the exile to help those returning to Israel to understand how to worship God. And we'll see also the second point there is the history focuses on the southern kingdom, that is the tribe of Judah, Benjamin and Levi. And uh, we see these tribes uh, tend to, more, to be more faithful to God in, uh, during the uh, rule. So the first chronicles, can we turn to book of first chronicles? And before we turn, let's see in the notes, uh, what does it say? A comparison of first and second chronicles to the other books. Uh, yeah, the causes of captive, we see here, and yes, this is what something that I would like to look into. The deparation occur occurred in three stages. In 605 BC, we see King Nebuchadnezzar first invaded Judah, that is the southern kingdom, and took away Joachim, the king Joachim, and the leading nobles, which includes Daniel. And in 597 BC, we see Nebuchadnezzar next invades Judah and took away Jehaikin and leading nobles, which includes Prophet Ezekiel. And in 586 BC, the third time Nebuchadnezzar invades Judah, and this time, uh, Zedekiah, the king, broke his alliance with Nebuchadnezzar and had entered into an alliance with Egypt to, to throw off the Babylonian yoke. And Jerusalem fell, both the city and the temple were destroyed. So this time, Jeremiah was taken as a captive to Egypt. And we see 70 years of captivity for Judah, which is the southern kingdom of Israel, was predicted by the prophet uh, Jeremiah in chapter 25 and we also see in chapter 29 and thus it happened in 2nd Chronicles chapter 36 and we also see that in the book of Ezra and this is a comparison between Samuel Kings with Chronicles yes with this we will move on to a book from our Bible 1st Chronicles <coughs> so the 1st Chronicles I'll just stop the share. OK. So the first chronicles begin with the first nine chapters of genealogy. Long list of names. And you will read these and think that this is kind of boring. And that may be true for some of us, but actually, these are very important. 
you know, when we go through the genealogy, we understand the lineage of the descendant. So the further list and genealogies have been scattered throughout the rest of First Chronicles. In between the book of First Chronicles, we also see David's ascension to the throne and his action thereafter. And, uh, and we see how uh, the shaping of genealogies emphasize on the two key lineage. One is the messianic king and the priesthood. So the first in the line of the promise, Messiah King. So a lot of space is uh, dedicated to tracing the line of Judah. And that led all the way to King David, to whom the messianic promise was given. And then from David, we see uh, the author traces the line up into his own day. The other family line that receives a lot of attention, and uh, that is the priesthood the descendants of Aaron, who, of course, served in the temple. And we see that um, the author has designed the book to emphasize two clear themes throughout the book. First, we see there's a hope that he creates of the messianic king. And the second, we see the hope of a new temple. So here we see the author uh, gives a strong uh, hope again and again that the Messiah, the, there is a Messiah, he will come and he will come to build a new temple and um, it's rooted in these genealogies. So that's the main reason why uh, it's been repeated, the same thing that has been uh, um, stated in the book of Samuel and book of Kings has been repeated in the book of Chronicles. Now, we may think, why is it repeated? Does this also remind us of any other book that God repeated things? Was there any yeah, book? Deuteronomy? Yes, yes, yes. God repeated. Why did God repeat Deuteronomy? Why did God repeat the same things? Again, God instructed Moses to uh, tell the generation what happened in Egypt. I guess to remind them again. Yes. Yes, Lubega, please go ahead. I think basically because God was talking to the to another generation, it, God was like telling them because we we almost know that uh, there were only two people who were remaining on the former generation who had had the information before. I think that was Caleb and Joshua. So since they were going into the promised land and these were new people, so that's why God had to repeat uh, the information to them, and that's why we call it the Deuteronomy the second book. Thank you. Yes, yes, brother. Thank you. That's exactly yes, because uh, they were in the wilderness for about 40 years. The older generation were almost gone and the younger generation who have grown, they would not even know why they are in the wilderness, why they are living in the tent, what is happening around them. So Moses tends to repeat repeat and tell the generation, remind them. So God is actually asking Moses to remind the generation of how God supernaturally rescued them from the 400 years of slavery. So that's the reason of the repeat. The same thing here. <clears throat> In the book of Chronicles, again, there's a repeat. Why do you think it's been repeated about David? Though we have seen the stories about David and most of these are uh, familiar from the book of Samuel and Kings. But again, there's something really different in this chapter. We see that the author leaves all the negative stories about David. Where he, portray, uh, he does not portray about his weakness or the immoral character or about uh, Saul chasing David around the desert and persecuting him there or uh, the story of David's adultery with Bathsheba and then murdering her husband. 
all that is not mentioned here but then david has been uh, portrayed as a uh, in a very as a good king in a very positive manner and god's covenant blessing over david and his descendants so this reminds us it uh, does not it doesn't mean that the author want to uh, leave away the flaws of david uh, but then the author is mindful that it has been written in the other books which we would anyways get to know but then uh, here the main intention of the author of the first and second chronicles are for us to know the faithfulness of god even though when david made mistake god is a god of mercy and forgiveness when david repented when he genuinely asked sorry god forgave david and also it also shows that god is a promise keeper when he makes a covenant he keeps his covenant yes he punishes those who sin yes he punished david's descendants and even david you know um, he had to face his consequence of his sin but then even the later part we see uh, whenever uh, uh, the kings or the later descendants of david when they made mistake and they repented we see the heart of god the forgiveness of god the mercy of god over his descendants to keep them he does not remove them just like how he removed saul and his family but then the covenant promise that he made with david throughout we see how god keeps his covenant that through his descendants the messiah the hope of messiah will be fulfilled so we uh, we learn something new that we find in this uh, we don't find in the book of samuel and we only see in these book is the very positive uh, david in a very positive light so we see in first chronicles uh, chapter uh, before we go to first chronicles chapter 22 i would like to <clears throat> share about uh, uh, as we study the genealogy in chapter 4 uh, we see chapter 4 we see verse 9 and 10 a short story about a prayer of jabez okay we it does not clearly say about uh, his is complete detail but in chapter 9 it says and jabez was more honorable than his brothers and his mother called his name jabez okay it gives a genealogy of who son who begat whom and then it gives a story about jabez that jabez was more honorable than his brothers so years a person called jabez and he was more honorable than his brothers and his mother called him jabez saying because i bore him in pain because i bore him in pain and so in this verse 10 we see jabez called on the god of israel now what is it in the name does the name make difference does name matters class you can go ahead and tell me Does name matter? Yes, the viewer says name matters. Yes, Nikki, Nikki, please go ahead. Um. Yes. Yeah. So I, I think it definitely matters for the simple reason, even in the Bible, that you see Paul became Saul, then Israel, and so many names were changed. Um. My understanding of why it matters is because of. just the power of confession also 
you're confessing that over your life and you're calling that person that so that is one i think that's the main reason what you're confessing constantly and that's what happens in your life and with your permission can i just sneak in a question in between this yes yes please <laughs> so i've had this question for a long time about jabez that it says he bore him with pain and uh, this is my understanding of it of why would someone go out of the way to say that she bore him with pain and the and i thought one could be because actually that maybe they were all living with so much faith that the others didn't really have so much pain but this one particular person had pain and it had she mentioned it in the word of god is it something like that or is it some other reason this was around the time when my wife was pregnant that's why i was wondering why so anyway you can answer this thank you uh yes thanks nikki yeah unlike you we all may have different questions about you know chabes and why actually he made a prayer like this and when the mother says i bore him in pain what actually the pain mean was it the uh, the natural pain that every delivery women goes through or was it something to do with her personal life or in the season when she carried the child jabes in her womb we actually don't know because it's not clearly mentioned we don't know this we all of a sudden this prayer just comes in between but what is our learning what is the essence of these two verse about jabes is what is no matter what his background was no matter i'll come to that point okay so i want to i i'll answer to your question i'm sure as i shared it will answer because if i go to the conclusion that i will not be able to explain what i wanted to say here the importance of the name so why the name was important in the jewish tradition or for some of us even now it goes back to genesis you know chapter 1 2 uh, where uh, you know god gave man the power uh, power that man is not even aware of now but but then adam knew the power because god trained adam in the garden of eden by telling adam uh, uh, he brought all the animals and he said adam name them so whatever adam named them one by one and they were called by that name and the very nature of each animal was that and they became that so we see that god was teaching adam the power was in his mouth in his mouth because god told man to have dominion over the earth and so imagine that uh, they were a big dinosaur and a, a huge mammoth those days and uh, we i don't think adam was controlling them with uh, uh, with a stick no but then adam would have just controlled them by his word he would have just spoke to them and they obeyed god Uh, you know god made adam sovereign over all the creatures of the earth isn't that amazing and same way as he was uh, and adam was also trained by god there eh, that uh, to know that there was power in his words and so in the bible we see that wherever the word of king is there is power especially we read that in the book of samuel kings and chronicles and uh, but but we are using how are we using our words today are we using it uh well or are we using it by speaking negative that leads to death because we see in proverbs 18 21 it says uh, the death and life is in the power of our tongue so whatever we speak we have the power and later in the same uh, in the book of genesis we see uh, eve, adam and eve sin and you know they they fall and uh, you know we see god saying uh, you came from dust and dust you shall return so what did yes that uh, that very word was became effective in adam's life and we see but that took 930 years for that to take effect but at that moment his spirit died 
So uh, we saw the process of dying. But this is what God said to them. They have sinned. And in sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it, you may take it. We see that in Genesis chapter 3, 19 to 20. Well, uh, when God said that to Adam, he turned, he turned to Eve. We see in the book of Genesis chapter 3, if you take, Okay, uh, when God created Adam and Eve, you know, God only gave name to Adam and he called both of them. See, when you turn to the book of Genesis chapter 3, I'm sorry, I didn't mark and keep the verse ready, but then I'll just see. He named them both Adam. Did anyone find that verse? I think it is in chapter 2. Out of ground, uh, chapter, verse 19, chapter 2, verse 19, out of the ground of the Lord God formed every beast, okay? And whatever Adam called it, not that. So is it uh, Genesis 5-2? I'm just checking, brother. One second, please. Yes. Male and female, bless every man, can they create it? And no, no, not that, not that, sorry. Uh, I, I can give that verse later to you all. Is that okay, please? Is it 127, ma'am? Uh, but God created, where is the name Adam first appeared? He created man and uh, women and, and called them Adam. There is a verse. Um, okay. Uh, I, I can get that verse and give it to you. Sorry. Uh, okay, we'll get back to our lesson. <clears throat> so God called both of them Adam. And uh, we see when, when God told them, you shall return to dust, immediately we see Adam knew the sentence of death has been pronounced over both of them, but he loved his wife. So he turned straight into her and said, but you shall be the mother of all living. And he called her Hava in Hebrew. In English, we call it Heave. But in Hebrew, it is called as Hava. You will be living and not dying. And you will be imparting and proclaiming life. Amen. So this is what Adam gave name to Eve, knowing the power of words. We need to believe uh, you know, in the power of the word that we speak into our life. Is it bringing life or death? In the same way, Jabez, you know, uh, uh, no matter what his mom named him, what his mother named him, okay, saying Jabez that I bore him in pain, okay, but Jabez, knowing the power on the God of Israel, the one true God, he looks up to God. He looks up to God. See, verse 9 says, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers. But in midst of all that, Jabez saying that I want to be a blessing, blessing to your people. And he looks up to God and he calls on the God of Israel, knowing the power that God can bless him despite his name. God can change his life and make him a blessing than anyone, you know, uh, when he seeks the God of Israel. That's why in verse 10, he, he prays this way. Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. That your hand would be with me. So he know the power 
on the importance of the hand of God and that you would keep me from evil that I may not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. So uh, the point that we wanted to make here is Jabez, despite a situation, despite what the people called him, what his mom named him, okay, what people looked at him, you know, he called on God of Israel. And when he called on the God of Israel, God answered his prayer request. God responded to him and his prayer was answered. And we also see the foreshadowing in uh, First Chronicles chapter 16, verse 33, that David's song of thanksgiving to God. And he refers to the time when uh, God will come to judge the earth. And this foreshadow we also see in Matthew. Matthew chapter 25, in which Jesus describes the time when he will come to judge the earth. And later part, we see through the parables of the ten virgin and the talents, he warns that those who are found uh, without the blood of Christ covering their sin will be cast into utter darkness. He also encourages his people to be ready because he is coming. And we also see uh, uh, Jesus uh, demonstrating like he will separate the sheep from the goats in the time of judgment. So part of this Davidic covenant, which God reiterates in uh, First Chronicles chapter 17 from 13 to 14. Can we turn to 17? Yeah, 13 to 14, we uh, or from 11 onwards, we can read and it shall be when your days are fulfilled, when you must go to be with your fathers, that I will set up your seed after you and who will be of your sons and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build me a house and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. And I will not take mercy away from him as I took it from him who was before you. Your God is talking about Saul. And verse 14, he says, I will establish him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And this throne shall be established forever. So here we see it refers to the future Messiah who would descend from the lineage of David describes the son who will establish in God's house and whose throne will be established forever. This can only refer to Jesus Christ. So we see uh, in the genealogies as the ones in First Chronicles uh, may seem very dry. Uh, sometimes we may think it's not important, but then Time and now we see God reminding his children about the uh, uh, the descendant, the lineage. Uh, so that uh, we see in Matthew chapter 10, 30, we see that God knows each of his children by their personality, even to the number of hair on our head. So from this fact, that we can take comfort that, you know, uh, we are in God's mind. God is mindful of each of us. And also, in uh, we also see the confirmation in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verse 8. It says, we belong to Christ and our names are written in the uh, book of Lamb of Life. Lamb's book of life. So we see that God is faithful to his people. He keeps his promise and he brings the descendant. That's the main reason time and again we see God, uh, you know, the authors are mentioning the lineage. Very, very important because God promised that there would be a messa messianic king coming from the lineage of David. So we need to know through whom it is coming and how it's coming. And throughout the story, we see God is a covenant keeper. And he's a God of mercy, God of forgiving. He forgives us when we repent and, you know, uh, he blesses us. And also uh, we go back to verse uh, chapter 11, verse 1, 2, 3. We see the fulfillment of God's promise to David when he made king all, uh, you know, over all Israel. We can, uh, we can be sure that his promise to us will be fulfilled, no matter what promise God has made, no time that tarries. But in the book of Habakkuk 2, we see that write down your vision, write down your promise, and there will be a due time. Without any tarry, it will be fulfilled. Don't worry even when it is getting delayed. But a God who promised, he will fulfill it. He will bring it to come to pass. So as he promised the blessing to those who follow him, 
who come in Christ in repentance and who obey his word, God will bless them. So that is the learning we see in the book of Samuel, in the book of Kings, and in the book of Chronicles. We see that obedience brings blessing and disobedience brings judgment. So we may have a question. Okay, we went through all this in the book of Samuel, in the book of Kings, and again, repeat of David's story. But here we see the positive side of David has been repeated as David is the ideal king in order, uh, in order to, uh, you know, the type of Messiah, the future Messiah would be from the line of David. It would be very similar to how Jeremiah or Ezekiel speaks about the coming Messiah as a new king, David. We will study when we cover those books later on. So uh, this is most clear how the author retells the story of God's covenant promise to David in the book of Chronicles, especially in the first Chronicle. When we compare the story, uh, which is parallelly to 2 Samuel chapter 7, we see the author of Chronicles highlighting that David uh, uh, or Solomon or any other king when, uh, when not the king, uh, the messianic king, which they are talking about, but it is uh, the Messiah is going to come from this lineage. And we know who's that messianic king now. But then back then they had a hope that there is a messianic king who will come from the lineage of David. So as we study these stories about David and Solomon and his son and his son and their sons and their descendants lineage, it gives us the hope for the future. For the people at that time who were studying or reading and they were waiting upon the Messiah whom the prophets have been prophesying or continuously talking about. It gives them the hope that the Messiah will come from this lineage. So with this, we will move on to Second Chronicles. <clears throat> uh, yeah, we see uh, before the uh, second, we could start the Second Chronicles. In the First Chronicles, we see how David's praised God and, you know, passing off David to Solomon and Solomon has been anointed as king. <clears throat> and the second Chronicles uh, starts with the wisdom of Solomon. And we see there's a lot of new things we can learn about uh, these kings from David's lineage, how the kings were obedient to God and how uh, their obedience led to success in God's blessing. And at the same time, we also see some some stories about the kings who were unfaithful to God. They didn't follow the Torah. Or uh, they led Israel to worship idols. And these kings, you know, uh, they were, uh, they had to face horrible consequences because, you know, they defiled the temple. And they led the people of Israel to worship idols and child sacrifice was happening in those days. And all these things, you know, stirred the anger of God and, you know, they were led, uh, this led to Israel's exile. And we see the, uh, we saw that how King Nebuchadnezzar invaded Israel three times and then later Egypt. So when the whole section of repeat becomes a series of chapter study, when the author wants later generation of Israel to learn from their family history. And so they become faithful to their God and to keep up the Torah. We see some of the kings here in uh, uh, Second Samuel, Second Chronicles. Uh, the story of Asa, we see how he obeyed God and how God blessed him. God gave him peace all around the place, just like Solomon. And <clears throat> sorry, we also see uh, King Jehoshaphat's story in chapter 20. Can we turn to chapter 20? I would recommend as always, okay, it's just a survey, so we cannot cover each and every chapter or every king's story. But then I would request you all to please go through this book and go through each and every story. And uh, for now, I we will just read one of them. That is King 
Jehoshaphat, who was from the lineage of David, what happened. So we see in chapter 19, then King the Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned safely to his house in Jerusalem. And, you know, uh, we go through it. And uh, he, he obeyed God and he followed the God of Israel. And for every war, every battle that came up, he used to inquire uh, with God through his prophets and then step into it. And we see in chapter 20, there were three kingdoms. Amen, Moab, and Mount Seir came against came against Jehoshaphat. So what happened now? Verse 3, chapter 20, verse 3, we see that Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah, that is the southern kingdom of Israel. And Judah gathered together to ask help from the Lord. And from all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And we see Jehoshaphat stood in the assembly, okay, uh, by, by uh, assembly, and from all the cities of assembly of Judah and Jerusalem, in the house of the Lord before the new court, and said, "O Lord God of our fathers, and you, are you not God in heaven and?" Do you not rule over all the kingdom of the nation? And in your hand is there not power and might so that no one is able to withstand you? He just prays and he gets a, uh, he gets a, a, a message through his prophet that God, uh, they come and say that, you know, the battle belongs to Fourteen. Then the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the priest, the son of Peniah. Okay, he says, listen, all you of Judah and you inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat, thus says the Lord to you. Do not be afraid nor dismayed because of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. So tomorrow you go down against, against these three kingdoms and God will fight for you. And verse 17, you will, you will not need to fight in this battle, but position yourself, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord who is with you. O Judah and Jerusalem, do not fear nor dismay. Tomorrow go out against them for the Lord is with you. So Jehoshaphat believes on this promise, whatever they said. And what he does is we see he puts the singers, the men who praise God before in the battle. Usually, how do they prepare for the battle? They they would prepare with a mighty man of valor. They put the strongest men uh, in front. But then Joseph had prepared this battle in a much different way because God said through his prophet that the battle belongs to God. Okay, battle belongs to God. So, uh, you know, he stands uh, strong with that word and he puts the uh, the musician, the one who praises God in the friend and, you know, the others later. And he says, and they sing like this. They go marching to the battlefield saying, praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever, verse 21, which is a very powerful praise. Let's say which the king raises the praise to the Lord. And verse 22, now when they began to sing, and to praise the Lord, praise, the Lord set ambush against the people of Amen, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, and they were defeated. So what happened? We see the power of praise, the power of praise. So just like Jehoshaphat, if we have such, uh, you know, a huge uh, situation before us, what would we do? Would we seek man's help or would we seek God? Whose help do we seek in our life? If any circumstance as such arises, it can be financial, it can be health, it can be our career, it can be a personal life can be any of the situation that could arise as a big mountain or a big battle just before us, like how it has arisen suddenly for Jehoshaphat, where he was not prepared. How would we face?
anyone in the class can unmute and answer. So just like Joshaphat, we need to we need to inquire with the Lord. We need to first bring it to the Lord, even if before we could take help from any man. We need to bring it to the Lord. There's nothing wrong in taking godly counsel or getting the medical advice, seeking doctors, taking medicine, or taking help from others despite our situation or what our situation may be. But then first is we need to bring the case to the Lord. We need to inquire with the Lord so that the Lord can deliver us. And when we praise in our situation, praises pleases God. So that we don't have to fight the battle, but then God takes it. God fights our battle and the victory belongs to us. Just like how God fought the battle for King Joshua. You don't have to. By the time uh, they reach the battlefield, he saw everyone dead. In the later verse, we see everyone were dead. Not even one man was alive. And it took three days for them to take the spoil because uh, the goods that these people carried for the battle was huge. And it took three days for them to gather the spoil and come back. And God gave them victory and the you know and uh, the king Jehoshaphat and his people rejoiced over the victory what God gave them and God, they praised God they made sacrifice unto God so just like that when we bring our situation our uh, our battle front of God it can be anything God gives us the victory God gives us the victory when we seek him he is the same God who's, who was then and now. And he is the same God who answers our prayer. He is a living God. Now, the book con <clears throat> conclusion is very unique. At the very end of this book, we see the king of Persian. And his name is Cyrus. And he tells the Israelites that they can go back home, return from exile. And he's also not only sending them back home, but he's telling them, rebuild the city and the temple. And here he says, you know, the last line, very abruptly it ends. The last verse. <clears throat> Chapter 36, verse 23, it says, whoever there is among you and all of his people, may the Lord as God be with him and let him go up and let him go up. And that's how the book ends with an incomplete sentence. Now, of course, the author knows that oh, the first return from exile and the story of Ezra and Nehemiah, but clearly in his view, the prophetic hope of Israel were not fulfilled in those events. And so this incomplete ending shows that the author uh, hopes is set on yet another return from exile when the Messiah will finally come to rebuild the temple and to restore God's people. So the book of Chronicles, uh, uh, we see that there is a hope, hope that God still keeps his covenant promise. God still shows mercy and God yet rebuilds his temple and his people. And we also see that God will... Uh, yet come in great sovereign saving mercy and grace towards his people. So the book of Chronicles, as well as the book of Samuel and Kings, we see the pattern of sin, repentance, forgiveness, restoration of the nation of Israel. And in the same way, we also see in the, uh, in the New Testament, in 1 John 1, 9, that God is patient with us and he forgives us our sins. When we come to him in true repentance, we see that throughout the book, how God forgave the kings who ever repented. The same way we can take uh, uh, confidence and comfort in that fact that, you know, God hears our prayer. He understands our situation and he forgives our sin when we repent genuinely. He restores us to that fellowship with him, to that intimacy with him, 
and sets us on path of joy. So this is what our learning would be from the book of Chronicles that covers both the first and second Chronicles when we study each king's life, the one who disobeyed God and had to face the consequence of their very own act. And for the kings who obeyed God, we see the hand of blessing on them. And there are certain kings, yes, they disobeyed initially, but they learned from their mistake. When they repented, we see the mercy of God forgiving them and restoring them back. And then we see the blessing of God in their life. So this is what the first and second chronicles is all about. So now I open to the class. You would like to share anything you can add on from what we studied or from the book of first and second chronicles. If I've not covered, yes, I've not covered many aspects, but the main points I touched upon. Is there anything that you would like to add on? it would be a blessing to us as a class. Anyone in the class, what was our learning? Anyone? Yes, brother, please go ahead. Brother Lubega, please go ahead. I wanted to add something about the story of Jabez. Yes, brother, please go ahead. When, when you read in the extra books of the Bible, uh, the Mishnah, when you try to read in the Babylonian Talmud, and when you try to read also in the Jerusalem Talmud, you realize that this madame called that boy that name, not basically because of the natural pain she had in giving birth, but because it automatically every mother has the same issue. But basically, she called him this name because it was an outcast for a child to be called by, to be referred to by his mother's side. So since this boy wasn't referred to by the names of his dad, it means that this boy was given birth when the mom was at their home, which was a, a, a mischief, which was not right in their family or in the Jewish culture. Hence, saying that I bore him out of pain. Thank you so much. Thank you, brother. Thank you so much. Nikki, initially uh, you asked for a question. Did, was your question answered? Yes, yes. Thank you, Brother Lubega and Pastor Diana. Thank you. Yeah. A any other learning I open to the class you would like to add on to the point? Anyone? Zeli, Divya, Brother Subhashish? Anyone in the class? Georgia, Hamilton, Brother Isaac? Jeffina, since a long time, you've been very quiet. Please go ahead. I just called out a few names. It can be anyone from the class. Alan or Sid. Okay. As the time is up. Okay, but was the class helpful? Will be able to understand it? We learned something new. The class is silent. Am I audible? I see a comment. Okay, it would be nice if you can verbally say so that that will be helpful. I see a lot of comments coming up. Okay, praise God. Yes, ma'am. We learned a lot of new things, and it was a blessing for us in our spiritual walk of life. Praise God. Thanks, Sid. Thank you, ma'am, for sharing this knowledge. Praise God. OK. OK. Thank you. OK. Let's end this class with a word of prayer. 
Dear God, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, we honor you. You are our God, you are our Lord, the God who were then is the same God who is with us now. You are the true living God, the God of Israel. You are the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David. The same God is alive and living in midst of us. You are the God of understanding. You are the God of forgiveness. You are the God who keeps the covenant, who makes the covenant and you keep the covenant. You are the God who is faithful, Lord. Lord, today I lift up each and every student who are attending this class now and later. Lord, I pray and I thank you that you have called each one of us and you are faithful to that calling, Lord. You will strengthen us in the way, in the, uh, the path that we walk in, O oh Father. During the difficult times, Lord, as we seek you, I pray that you will be with us. You will strengthen us. You will answer our prayer just, just the way you answered Jabez's prayer. You will be with us just the way you were with King David and you led him, you blessed him and his descendants. Same, you will bless us, Lord. We also pray for the greater wisdom, O oh Father, the way you bless King Solomon. Same way, you will bless each of us with your wisdom, the wisdom of Jesus. As we read in the book of New Testament, saying that Jesus grew in wisdom, knowledge and understanding. Lord, I speak that over each one of us in our class and we will listen later. We'll watch this class later. That we speak that your wisdom will be increased in us, Lord. You are the source of all wisdom. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, that you are comforting us and you're leading us. That you are the God of hope. That no matter what we face in our life, the battle belongs to God. When we, when we bring it to you, when we inquire with you, you are the God who will bless us. You will fight our battles and you will give us the rest and you will give us the victory. And our hope is in you. We claim this over each one of us, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Amen. Class, thank you so much for joining in today's session. God bless. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. God bless.